We're continuing in Job today, Job chapter 38, and we're going to be going through chapter 41. Uh, before we get started today, man, what a great VBS we had. I mean, all the workers and everybody that, that uh, took part in that, what a great uh, and awesome thing that the Lord did there. We averaged over 80 kids a night, so praise the Lord for that. It was wonderful. I uh, just heard a testimony today of a uh, man that is, and is a, he's an adult now, but he wasn't raised in a, in a family of believers, and his life went sideways, and he said that he remembered a lot of the things that he'd learned in VBS because a friend of his invited him to VBS. And so God can use VBS to turn and change lives as adults, and so we need to keep that uh, in the forefront, and so praise the Lord for that. Um, last week, Church in the Park was packed. If you missed it, you missed a blessing. It was great. The Lord watched over us, and it was a great day. Um, today is July the 1st. Isn't that amazing? I mean, I thought it was just New Year's the other day. I mean, don't you think? It, it's just gone so fast. Today, we are in the second to last sermon in Job. I look back, and we started Job in February. Walked, been walking through Job since February. So we've got today, and then we've got next week, and then we're starting the book of 1 John after that, okay? So you can read ahead if you want to. I won't mind. Um, as we've been walking through Job, we have seen from the beginning, Job is a man that was righteous, but he lost everything, right? We see that in the first two chapters, Satan has come before the Lord, God the Father, and he's talking about going from here and there, and God says, have you considered my servant Job? And then Satan says, oh man, anybody will worship you if he's got everything he needs. God said, well, okay, you can take it. Just don't touch him. He's mine. So he did. He continued to praise the Lord. And then he says, okay, anybody can, anybody can follow you if you're healthy. And he said, okay. He said, you can touch him, but don't kill him because he's mine. He had to get permission. And so he broke out in sores and boils. He was a rich man. He's gone from the penthouse to the outhouse, seriously. He is now at the point of writing, of writing the rest of Job. He is outside of the city gates in a trash dump. And he is scraping his sores to try to give himself some relief. He has been cursed with three friends that all they do is tell him that he's guilty about something. Then last week we saw, or two weeks ago, we saw Elihu step forward. Elihu was the youngest of the bunch, and Elihu actually knew what he was talking about. He was the one, he was younger than all the other three, but he was more wise than the other three. And he instructs Job that you're just too self-righteous, that's your problem. So we get to today. Job has pled all through the book here. I want to have an audience with God. Okay? I want God to answer all my questions for me. I want him to answer why he's done this to me, why I went from, from living the high life to living the low life, and, and why. And so he has asked and asked and asked to have an audience with God, and now he gets it. And he was not prepared for what's about to happen. Now, I want to set the stage for you. Elihu last week, chapter 37, I believe that Elihu is speaking to Job and the other men in the midst of an electrical storm coming their way. Okay, just the, the outline, the lightning, and the way that, that Elihu is writing, I think that it's very possible that he's out there in the trash area and, and there amongst the clouds, and you see this storm building. And now we see he is there before God. All of them are before God. And then we see verse 38, or chapter 38, verse 1. Then the Lord answered, the, answered Job from the whirlwind. I think that storm has continued. I think it's gotten closer. And now it's kicked off a tornado. And this was no ordinary tornado. This was a God tornado. And he speaks to Job from the tornado. Now, that's not exactly what Job was expecting. 
Job was expecting a courtroom, God sitting on the bench, dealing out justice and truth. But that's not how it happened. Just imagine that today. All your questions before the Lord, you want answers, and you're pleading for God to answer, and you don't get a courtroom, you get a tornado and a thunderstorm. Now, he, he speaks here in chapters 38 through 41 and a bit in 42. He speaks, this is the longest discourse in Scripture of God speaking all at once. Okay? He is preaching to Job. He is asking him question after question after question. Seventy in all. And Job is going to have to respond some way. Now just imagine yourself now as we dig into the scripture today. Just imagine sitting there on your front porch seeing a storm coming and a tornado in front of your house. And God speaks to you out of the midst of it. Brace yourself because God's about to speak. Join me. Chapter 38 beginning in verse 1. Then the Lord answered Job from the whirlwind, and he said, Who is this who obscures my counsel with ignorant words? That's God's first line. Wow. I thought God was supposed to be warm and fuzzy in this big granddad. You know, long beard, you know, with endless amounts of cash to give us when we sat on his lap asking him for this and that and... I thought God was supposed to be this loving, touchy-feely kind of God. No. No, God here answers Job directly. He starts with, who are you? Who are you that obscures my counsel with these ignorant words? Now, here he tells him to get ready to answer me like a man. When I question you, you will inform me. Whew, this is not starting out good for Job. Where were you when I established the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who fixed its dimensions? Certainly you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? Who or what supports its foundation? Who laid its cornerstone? While the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Who enclosed the sea? Behind doors when it burst from the womb, when I made the clouds its garment and thick darkness its blanket, when I determined its boundaries and put its bars and doors in place, when I declared, you may come this far but no further, your proud waves stop here. Have you ever in your life commanded the morning or assigned the dawn its place so it may seize the edges of the earth and shake the wicked out of it? The earth is changed as clay is by a seal. It, its hills stand out like a folds of a garment. Light is withheld from the wicked. The arm raised in violence is broken. Have you traveled to the sources of the sea or walked in the depths of the ocean? Have the gates of death been revealed to you? Have you seen the gates of deep darkness? Have you comprehended the extent of the earth? Tell me if you know all of this. Where is the road to the home of light? Do you know where darkness lives so you can lead it back to its border? Are you familiar with the paths to its home? Don't you know? You were already born. You have lived so long. Have you entered the place where snow is stored or have you seen the storehouses of hail? Which I hold in reserve for times of trouble, for the day of warfare and battle. What roads leads to the place where light is dispersed? Where is the source of the east wind that spreads across the earth? Who cuts a channel for the flooding rain or clears the way for lightning? To bring rain on the uninhabited land, on a desert with no human life. To satisfy the parched wasteland and cause the grass to sprout. Does the rain have a father? Who fathered the drops of dew? Whose womb did the ice come from? Who gave birth to the frost of heaven when water becomes as hard as stone and the surface of the water's depths is frozen? Can you fashion the chains of the Pleiades or loosen the belt of Orion? Can you bring out the constellations in their season and lead the bear to her cubs? 
Do you know the laws of heaven? Can you impose its authority on earth? Can you command the clouds so that the flood of water covers you? Can you send out lightning bolts and they go? Do they report to you? Here we are. Who put wisdom in the heart? Or gave the mind understanding? Who has the wisdom to number the clouds? Or who can tilt the water jars of heaven? When the dust hardens like cast metal and the clods of dirt stick together. The beginning of this response to Job is nothing like Job wanted to hear. Job's question was, God, why in the world is this happening to me? We've all asked that question. You may be asking that question right now. You may be in a place in your life where things are in turmoil or mixed up or whatever the case may be, and you're asking God, why in the world is this happening to me? Why now? God here does not answer Job's question. The first thing that he shares with Job and emphasizes is that, number one, he is the creator. He's the creator, not us. Right? We have become a society that has so much technology that we have lulled ourselves into thinking that we can actually create things. I mean, we do something on the computer, and we do this, and we do that, and we, oh, look at that. I created that. Huh. God says, you can maybe do that, but have you told the sun when to come up? Have you told the stars where they should be? Job is being reminded here very clearly by the Lord that he is not God. And as humans, we need to be reminded of that every day. Because we start to begin to think that we can do it ourselves. That we have the power to create or destroy. That we have the power to make the sun come up and, and all of this. And we get into a, 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 a mindset to where we think that God owes us something. And that's where Job was. Job thought that God owed him something because he had lived this righteous life. In his self-righteousness, as pointed out by Elihu, Job thought that he deserved an answer. And God says, let me just tell you who I am. And, and let me just tell you too, we get the wrong questions. And God gives us a different answer because God doesn't point us to the answers of our question. He points us to him. Because in Christ, in God, we have the answers to all of our, all of our questions. We may not like the answers to the questions that we have. But God always has answers in himself. And that's what he's doing here. He is pointing Job to himself to recognize that he lacks wisdom and knowledge that only God can possess. Warren Wearsby, I love him. He's a great commentator. He writes a lot of good commentaries that are very basic and, and, and applicable. He says, knowledge of our own ignorance is the first step towards true wisdom. Okay, let me say that again. Knowledge of our own ignorance is the first step towards true wisdom. As my dad used to say, we get too big for our britches. We think we know it all. Right? Oh, phew. heck, I'm about to turn 50. I know everything about the world. I mean, I've got it all figured out. And then another day comes and we don't know anything. Right? If we can truly understand how awesome and great God is and how we are not any of that, then we can begin to start to understand that God is the creator of all things. You see, we get to focus on our problems, and we focus on our situation. And many times we become hopeless and helpless because we focus on the problems. And if we focus on the problems, everything else just fails. We, we, we just have tunnel vision, and everything else just fades away. 
And God's telling Job here, you're focusing on the wrong thing. He said, focus on me, the creator. And then everything else will fall and have the right perspective. If you're in the midst of a trial today or this week or for the past year, you may be focusing on your problems instead of the creator. God wants us to focus on him because he is the creator of all things, us included. There's a great book, Dr. David Bradstreet. He's a high-level astronomer. It's kind of interesting. In science circles, the majority of astronomers are Christians. It's interesting because astronomers look at the heavens and, and everything far distantly, and when they see that, they are overwhelmed by the understanding that that can't just have happened. Anyway, Dr. Bradstreet writes this in his book called Starstruck. He says, our planet is some, has some 10 to 14 million species living on it. He said, but let's consider the lowly dandelion. He said, it's found on every continent on earth. He said, these flourish, these plants flourish everywhere and anywhere. The flower heads are perfectly designed for maximum seed creation and dispersal. Each flowering head can disperse 50 to 175 seeds to the wind at one time. One single dandelion plant can create over 2,000 seeds in its lifetime. And he goes on, just think about plants in general. Plants produce oxygen. And he said this, it's interesting, he said, plants allow us to eat sunlight. Isn't that interesting? He goes on. He said, they produce oxygen, build topsoil, hold it in place, prevent floods. They, they scourge the atmosphere for carbon dioxide. They buffer extreme weather and they clean our water. He said, consider the way God has made life thrive in the deepest and darkest regions of even the ocean floor. Where no sunshine ever permeates the gloom, strange plants grow 20,000 feet below the surface, surviving on chemical nutrients emerging from vents in the ocean floor. It's this kind of mind-blowing biological diversity that I think, when I think about singing for the beauty of the earth, one of his favorite hymns. Understand today that God, in all of his magnificence, in all of his power and glory, has created everything. And when you're in the midst of trouble and trial and tribulation, quit focusing on that and focus on the creator. He will give you the right perspective. You go on. Verse 39, or yeah, verse 39 of 38, he said, can can you hunt prey for a lioness or satisfy the appetite of young lions when, the, when they crouch in their dens and lie in wait in their lairs? Who provides the raven's food when its young cry out to God and wonder about for lack of food? Do you know when mountain goats give birth? Have you watched the deer in labor? Can you count the months that they are pregnant so that you know the time that they give birth? They crouch down to give birth to their young. They deliver their newborn. Their offspring are healthy and grow up in the open field, and they leave and do not return. Who set the wild donkey free? Who released the swift donkey from its harness? I made the wilderness its home, and the salty wasteland its dwelling. It scoffs at the noise of the village. It never hears the sound, the shouts of a driver. It roams the mountains for its pasture land, searching for anything green. Would the wild ox be willing to serve you? Would it spend the night by your feeding trough? Can you hold the wild ox to her furrow by its harness? Will it plow the valleys behind you? Can you deepen it because of the strength is great? Would you leave it to do your hard work? Can you trust the wild ox to harvest your grain and to bring it to the threshing floor? The wings of the ostrich flap joyfully, but her feathers and plumage like the stork's. She abandoned her eggs on the ground. She lets them be warm in the sand. She forgets that a foot may crush them and that some wild animal may trample them. She treats her young harshly as if they were not her own, with no fear that her labor may have been in vain. For God has deprived her of wisdom. 
He has not endowed her with understanding. When she proudly spreads her wings, she laughs at the horse and its rider. Job here is being shown by God that not only is he the creator, but he is the sustainer. Too many people have this idea, wrongly I might add, that God set the earth on its axis and he started everything in motion and then God has stepped back and just let what's going to happen, happen. That is nowhere to be found in Scripture. God is not a distant God that just winds up the earth and lets it go and just take care of itself. That's not the case. God is an intimate God that steps into our lives. He's the one that sustains us. He's the one that, take a deep breath. God did that. He's the one that made the oxygen that covers the earth. He's the one that made every level of the atmosphere to the highest heights. And he's the one that made the lowest lows and the deepest darkness. Parts of the oceans that we don't even understand. God is the sustainer of all things. We think in the, in the midst of problems, as Job did, that obviously God is not watching he is too busy handling wars and rumors of wars. He's too busy dealing with, with those that are hungry in Africa. God is distant from me, and that is not true. God is basically telling Job here, I know the animals so well. And if I know them so well, how well do you think I know you and take care of you? Hmm. Jesus, in Matthew chapter 6, uses this same kind of understanding. He says, do you not know that God is the one who decorates the flowers of the fields? And he adorns them with splendor greater than Solomon. Do you not know that the birds do not have to search for food that the Father provides for them? And if the Father loves them like that, how much more for you? And then he goes on to say something, do not worry. Do not worry. You see, if you worry, you do not understand that God is your sustainer. Right, if you worry incessantly about this and about that, which you know worry and never does anything anyway, but make your blood pressure go up. If you worry and continue to worry about your troubles and your problems and all of these things, you are saying, God, you are not my sustainer. I'm taking care of this and I'm doing a poor job. If you are a constant worrier, you are slapping God in the face, saying, I don't believe that you can sustain me. He wants Job to understand beyond all understanding that, Job, I have created you and I sustain you. Psalm 55, 22 says this, Cast your burden upon the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never allow the righteous to be shaken. That's a promise of God. But it takes that first step, casting our burdens on the Lord. You see, when we worry, we keep them to ourselves. God says, give them to me. I'll take care of it. I will sustain you. Job needs to hear that right now because he, is, he has been complaining for 38 chapters. And now God's setting him straight. Let me ask you today, do you realize that everything you have, has been provided by the Creator. And that He sustains your very life today. How many of you are responsible for your heart beating right now? Raise your hand. You're not sitting there concentrating as you're listening to the sermon saying, beat, keep beating. Come on, please, get going. You're not doing that, right? 
How about breathing? Anybody right now just concentrating on, okay, in, out, repeat. Anybody doing that? It's because God is sustaining you. He has made this miraculous body of ours to take care of itself in many ways. What are you so worried about? There's a perfect example. I don't know if you remember, a lot of you won't, but back in the 90s, all of these scientists got together and they wanted to put together what they called the biosphere. They bought all this land in Arizona, right? Three acres underneath this big, like, geodesic dome. It covered three acres. It had plants and animals and it had all these things. And their idea was they were going to replicate the earth. Right? In this little area, in this three-acre area, they were going to do everything within that system that the earth does so that we can go to other planets and we can populate other planets and we will know how everything works. Okay? So they went through and they've got incredible systems that they put in place. It cost over $200 million to do this. But in just 1.3 years, everything collapsed. All of their, all, all of the efforts that they had made did not and could not sustain everything in this biosphere. 19 of the 25 vertebrate species that they had placed in there became extinct. All the species that could pollinate the plants became extinct. As did most of the insects. Water and air pollution became acute and temperature control was a problem. Even with all of the unlimited technical support, all of the ingenuity of the human mind, after just a little over a year, the biosphere collapsed upon itself. Only God can sustain life. As much as we try, we fail. As much as you try to sustain your own life, trying to do it your way, instead of casting your cares upon the Lord, as you try to sustain your, your Monday and your Tuesday and your Wednesday, and you get to the end of the week and you wonder why everything went so crazy, it's because you are trying to sustain your own life. That's God's job. It's not your job. The next thing that we see, we see that God is the conqueror. Skip with me to chapter 40. The Lord answered Job again. Will the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? Let him who argues with God give an answer. Now here he's calling Job out again. He said, okay, you know what's going on. You correct me if I'm wrong. Of course here Job, he finally answers in verse 3, I am so insignificant. How can I answer you? I place my hand over my mouth. I have spoken once. I will not reply twice, but now I can add nothing. Here, I think Job is finally broken down to the point of understanding his ignorance. He finally realizes he doesn't have it all figured out, and he said, I can't even open my mouth. Now, I don't think he has entered the place of repentance yet at this point. I don't think he's there because we'll see that more in chapter uh, 40, 42. But I think here he finally starts to see the beginnings of some, some clouds parting. That he doesn't have it all figured out. And then God points out to him, number, number three here is that he is the conqueror. Adorn yourself with majesty and splendor, he tells him in verse 10, and clothe yourself with honor and glory. Unleash your raging anger. Look on every proud person and humiliate him. Look on every proud person and humble him. Trample the wicked where they stand. Hide them together in the dust. Imprison them in the grave. Then I will confess to you that your own right hand can deliver you. Look at behemoth, which I made along with you. He eats grass like an ox. Look at the strength of his loins and the power of, his, of the muscles in his belly. 
He stiffens his tail like a cedar tree, and the tendons of his thighs are woven firmly together. His bones are bronze tubes. His limbs are like iron rods. He is the foremost of God's works. Only his maker can draw the sword against him. The hills yield food for him with all sorts of wild animals play there. He lies under the lotus plants hiding in the protection of marshy reeds. Lotus plants cover him with their shade. The willows of the brook surround him. Though the river rages, Behemoth is unafraid. He remains confident even if the Jordan surges up to his mouth or pierces his nose with snares. Can you pull in a leviathan with a hook or tie his tongue down with a rope? Can you put a cord through his nose or pierce his jaw with a hook? Will you beg for mercy? Will he beg for mercy or speak softly to you? Will he make a covenant with you so that you can take him as a slave forever? Can you play with him like a bird or put him on a leash for your girls? Will traders bargain for him and divide him among the merchants? Can you fill his hide with harpoons or his head with fishing spears? Lay a hand on him. You'll remember the battle and never repeat it. Any hope of capturing him proves false. Does a person not collapse at the very sight of him? No one is ferocious enough to rouse Leviathan. Who then can stand against me? Who confronted me that I should repay him? Everything under heaven belongs to me. He's now telling Job, he's not only the creator and the sustainer, but nothing, nothing can come against God and win. God is the conqueror. He gives us two examples here. First, he tells us about the behemoth. Right? A lot of people today, a lot of commentators think that the behemoth is a, is a hippopotamus. I'm not sure. I kind of disagree with the hippopotamus because you ever seen one? They got that little bitty skinny tail. Here in Scripture, it says that his tail stiffens like a cedar tree. Don't know what that is. Had to be pretty awesome, though. And then he talks about the Leviathan. And he goes on and he describes it. And a lot of people think that this is the crocodile. Huge crocodile. How can you go against that? He said, I'll tell you what. I'm the one that created it. I'm the only one that can defeat it and conquer it. He says, I am the conqueror, Job. I'm the one that can take care of every thing because there's nothing greater than me, God says. Now, Job need to remember this because remember, he's lost everything. He has nothing. He's trying to have a life here just to exist. And God is reminding him, no matter what it is that comes against you, I am the conqueror. And I will win. Don't you need to hear that some days? In the midst of the trial and the tribulation, knowing that we have a God that won't back down. That there's nothing that can come against us that will defeat God. He is our Father. If we are in Christ, if we have put our faith in Him, repented of our sin, Christ has put His Spirit in us, and we live and move and have our being in Him, and we see everything that comes against us can be defeated by God and not by us. God is the conqueror. What are you experiencing today? What is it that has got you down? What is it that has got you questioning if there's a God? What is it that has kept you from worshiping the Lord? If you've not been in church for a long time, what is it that's kept you from God? If you've turned away from the Lord, what is it that has kept you from, from an intimate relationship with God? What are these things that have conquered you? We don't like to think about that, do we? We just think that they're just problems in life. I'm mad at God, and so I'm not going to go play with his toys. I'm staying away from the church. I'm staying away from my Bible. I'm staying away from prayer because, dang it, God deserves to give me an answer. Maybe today you need to realize that all of those things that have conquered you, God wants to conquer. Amen. 
Is it health issues? Is it that sin that so easily entangles you? Or do you have an addiction? Are you in a bad relationship? Are you frustrated about your family? What is it that you need God to be the conqueror over? Because all you have to do is ask. He goes on in verse 33 and he says, God, he has no equal on earth. <laughs> Do you realize that our God has no equal? Amen. There's nothing like him. He is incredible. He is glorious. And he has conquered everything. I don't know if you remember your history. Interesting history, 1519, Spanish explorer Hernando Cortez, Cortez sailed into the harbor of Veracruz, Mexico. Now understand, he's sailing in there when people have failed and failed and failed and failed and failed to try to take over Mexico, to take over the Aztecs and the Zapotecs and the Mixtecs and all of these texts. And he comes in there and he has been successful now. We know the history. He came in and he, he's the one that conquered all of Mexico. And people have wondered how in the world was he so successful when everybody else, other conquerors, had sailed into the same place with the same weapons, with everything, and they failed miserably. Well, the key is, as history has shown us, that when, when they got everything off of the 11 ships, when Cortez made, Cortez made sure that everyone was off the ships, all of their supplies and everything were on the shores, and they began to make all of their, their housing arrangements and all of that, Cortez sent men out to the ships to burn them down. As all of them were on the shores, they saw the 11 ships that had gotten them across the Atlantic Ocean go up in flames. You see, the reason everybody else had been unsuccessful is because they had options. If this doesn't work out, we can get on our ships and go home. And so they weren't invested in the process. But Cortez understood that, and he understood human nature, and he says, we're going to invest ourselves completely in this. And they realized as Spaniards that it was either conquer or die. You look at the history of Mexico, they swept their way, they, they overran the Aztecs. They went through and took over in the entire Mexico because they were completely given to conquering the place that they were going. Understand this, Jesus said something different. He didn't kill everything to conquer, but he died so that he would be the conqueror. He didn't give his ships, he gave of himself. Christ, when he came and he died on the cross for us, he conquered death. He conquered sin. He conquered hell. Not in strength by weapons that, that, that wage war of this world. No, he did it in weakness. And he did it completely. He didn't crucify just one arm and a foot. Christ gave it all. Amen. And today we can understand that we have a God that is a conqueror. Job needed to hear that, and we need to hear that today. Some of you are still in your sin. You are not believers. Some of you have wrestled with God all your life, and you have just refused to, to bow the knee. <laughs> You don't want God to conquer you because you think your land is more valuable than what God wants to do with it. Today, understand, apart from Christ, apart from repenting of your sin, coming and putting your faith in Christ as the Savior, you will be apart from Christ forever. God is a gentleman. He will not force you to worship him. And that would indeed be one of the worst things he could do is if after you chose a life of, of going away from him and he made you be with him for eternity, that would be awful. 
But today, understand that Christ gave everything for you. He conquered death. We don't have to be afraid of death. We don't have to be burdened by our sin. We can give it to him. We don't have to, we don't have to, to drop and give him 20 every time we do something stupid. You see, Christ is the conqueror. He conquered all of that for us. If you don't know Christ today, I invite you. I invite you to come. Put your faith in him. Cast your cares upon the Lord, and he will sustain you. Maybe you're a believer here today already. You've put your faith in the Lord. You've repented of your sins. You've turned to him. But for some reason, you've not been walking with him. You've wanted to walk your own path. And God has brought you here today for a reason. He wants you back. Christ died for you. He gave everything for you. He wants you back. Your, your move. During this invitation, you can pray right where you are. You can come. I'll pray with you. We'll have men here to pray with you. We will lead you to Christ. We will pray whatever needs you have. Amen. But today is the day of salvation, not tomorrow. Not I'll come back to the Lord next week. You may not be guaranteed the next breath. That's right. Whatever it is today, God brought you here for a reason. And that reason, first of all, is that he loves you and he wants to speak to you. He wants to show you his grace and his mercy, his forgiveness, his love that never ends. That's what God wants for you. All you have to do is say, okay, God, I'm putting myself back here and I'm going to put you right here. Whatever God brought you here today for, don't miss it. Don't miss it. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that even while we were still sinners, Jesus, you died for us. That you don't expect us to clean up our life first before we come to you. That, that Jesus, you say that you'll take care of that. And Father, I ask you today, Lord, if there is one here that doesn't know you, Lord, I ask that your spirit will knock upon their hearts, Lord. Father, that you will draw them and they will understand that they need you. Father, I pray for us believers that you open our eyes to see how each day, Lord, we take paths that are not yours. Yeah. And Lord, I, I pray that you will bring us back as we wander away, as your sheep often do. Lord, we give you this time of invitation. We do so for your glory. Yeah. We thank you, for you indeed are the creator, the sustainer, and the conqueror. Amen. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.